Uh, it's actually been astonishing to watch unfold over uh, the last couple months, and in particular over the last week, uh, a transformation in the conventional wisdom from the presumption that SOPA and PIPA were basically a fait accompli, they were going to uh, pass more or less as drafted uh, with the possibility of some tweaking around the margins, um, to, uh, to a case where it's questionable whether either of them uh, can pass at all, and certainly uh, in, in nothing like their original forms. We saw just yesterday in response to, a, I think, an unprecedented act of coordinated internet protest, I think like 18 senators uh, so far uh, flipping uh, to oppose uh, SOPA and PIPA, including uh, seven former co-sponsors of that legislation uh, withdrawing their co-sponsorship. Uh, we saw congressional websites intermittently down from the traffic of people going to uh, to learn about the legislation and to contact their legislators. We saw uh, switchboards on the Hill jammed, millions of people signing petitions uh, opposing these bills. Um, and so it's a really kind of extraordinary shift, not just uh, on this particular bill, but in the larger sense that uh, you know a group of enormous lobbies whose uh, weight in this town is, is well known, uh, finding to their surprise that uh, they, they were perhaps not going to get their way on something that had been such a chief legislative priority. And it's, it's uh, emblematic, I think, of an important shift that uh, the internet itself is, is enabling. Uh, it's a sort of familiar public choice problem, right? The political outcomes tend to be driven by uh, concentrated interests because uh, you know, basically the, the big barrier to exerting political influence is the transaction costs to organizing. So if you have a policy that creates a concentrated benefit and then disperses the costs across a large population, whether it's a, a subsidy or a regulation, uh, you're going to have the people who get the concentrated benefit with a strong incentive to coordinate, to form long-term long institutions like the MPAA or RIAA that are able to uh, you know, coordinate their members and raise funds for, for action. Um, and that no longer apparently obtains because the transaction costs to organization have fallen so low that it's no longer apparent in advance who the players are. It used to be you could say, well, we know MPA will be for this, and you know NRA, AARP will come down here. You know who the players are. You know more or less where they're going to stand on it. But when organization is able to be ad hoc in this way, you don't know in advance who the players are. The players don't know themselves who they are until they discover it through the act of communicating about it. Um, so that's been a really astonishing shift. Uh, in terms of the legislation itself, um, we saw a manager's amendment uh, last month that tried to fix some of the uh, provisions of the legislation that people had objected to. We'll get into some more detail about what those are. Uh, just recently, um, the supporters have finally uh, suggested that they are willing to compromise on what I think had been rightly the most controversial and objectionable provision, which has to do with DNS blocking. I think it is still worth talking about that, first because we haven't actually seen the new text, so we don't know how, uh, how extensively that's fixed. We don't know, for example, whether uh, it's, it's just the compulsory DNS blocking that's removed or whether there's, uh, they're also taking out the immunity for... Um, sites that decide to you know, go above and beyond in terms of trying to block access to uh, so-called rogue sites. Um, and also because you know, the language that's been used so far is we need to delay and study it. So it's important, I think, to bear in mind why it's a bad idea if it's something that uh, is likely to uh, make a return at some point soon. Um, so coming up now, we have uh, still, as far as I know, a cloture vote set for the 24th, and Lamar Smith planning to resume markup on the House version, again amended in, um, uh, in February. Um, and again, this is a little disturbing because they're saying they have a bunch of fixes to uh, various problems that have been pointed out, uh, but it seems like the lesson of all this ought to be when you're doing something like regulating a complex a digital ecosystem, uh, throwing out legislative language and saying, well, we're going to, you know, now we've fixed it, uh, three days from now, we're, we'll move ahead, um, is not a good idea. DNSSEC, uh, which Dan knows all about, has been in development for 10 years. It's a slow process of sort of evolutionary consensus that makes the protocols that make the internet work. Uh, and so to think you can make drastic alterations uh, to them with a couple of days of discussion uh, and, you know, having talked about it with a couple of big stakeholders behind closed doors uh, and, you know, 
assume that you've foreseen all the problems uh, is, is, I think, the kind of hubris that has uh, led to the backlash we've seen. I just want to mention, incidentally, that you know, there's an old philosopher's joke. You know, one philosopher says, uh, look, you, you, uh, you say you have refuted my argument on the basis of these counterexamples. You've obviously misunderstood me. Um, you've, you have not interpreted me as I intended, because I didn't intend my argument to have counterexamples. Uh, and so we see something of the same thing in, in this legislation. Um, there's you know, sort of a, a series of clauses up front that say, this shall not be construed to be um, a prior restraint under the First Amendment, uh, and uh, this shall not be construed in a way that hampers cybersecurity, and this shall not be uh, construed to imply an affirmative duty by sites to monitor content. Um, I mean, I, I don't know why they didn't just add, and you know, this legislation shall not be construed to have any bad effects, and then anyone who complains can say, no, look, it's right in the legislation. It won't have any bad effects. Um, you know, the practical effect is that even if they say you don't have an affirmative obligation to monitor, um, if you are a skittish website trying to uh, attract investors, uh, you know, in effect, the, your best guarantee of not being branded a rogue site is to affirmatively monitor. Or, you know, if you're an information location tool, you know, it's not just search engines, information location tools in the U.S., if you are, uh, you know, worried about being... Uh, smacked with a, a fine or a contempt ruling for uh, not violating a court order to uh, to filter, your best defense here is to implement some more proactive mechanism of, uh, of, of filtering that stuff out. Um, and that, you know, again, that's a, a costly and, and, and burdensome affair and runs against, I think, the, the sort of end-to-end -end principle that the internet has run on, which is, you know, in general, stuff is open uh, and you can you know, uh, get stuff up, get it out there uh, without permission in advance. And, and this, I think, it just cuts against, cuts against uh, the spirit of that in, in a way that makes it harder to run the kind of platforms that, uh, you know, have been so innovative. I mean, so when you think about something like YouTube, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in YouTube involving, um, you know, use of copyrighted material in innovative and transformative ways that I think uh, you know, qualifies as fair use. All sorts of really fun and interesting video mashups that use relatively small components of copyrighted works. Um, you know, if you're trying to proactively police, if you're trying to filter in advance, um, you know, software has trouble telling a difference between, uh, you know, an, an illegitimate pirate copy and something making a fair use of, uh, uh, of, of copyrighted material, uh, you you are going to tend to get over blocking when you create an, an incentive structure that says, um, if you are aggressive about taking things down, you are immune from liability. Uh, and also, you're immune from liability for going too far. Uh, you know, it's, it's, then that's an incentive to go too far. When you're talking about stuff like circulation of, uh, you know, a pirated content, you know, the, the content itself that's circulating is digital and very often non-commercial, um, I mean, at some level, I, I mean, I hate to sort of offer a counsel of despair. I realize we're all supposed to say, you know, but we'll find this other way to fix piracy. Um, I, you know, I think the, 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 the fact here is it is cheaper and easier to circulate large amounts of digital content than it has ever been in human history, and never again in human history will it be this expensive and this difficult to circulate large amounts of digital content. It is only going to get easier whatever Congress does today or tomorrow or in a year, unless they're willing to shut down the open internet completely. Um, so at some level, I, I do think you sort of have to say, um, there are just limits to how much you can do to directly stop this. You can make it somewhat inconvenient. Uh, having made it somewhat inconvenient, there is not a lot more you can do. And the remedy at that point, I think, has to be, um, how do we find ways to make digital content available at a price that makes piracy an unattractive alternative. Um, we've already seen, I think, Netflix doing that. I mean, why would you go to the Pirate Bay um, when for 10 bucks a month you have this very convenient stream of movies? Um, that's, I think, the effective anti-piracy tool. Um, at some level, I think we need to sort of start with the admission that blocking, you know, ending circulation of that digital content at any kind of acceptable cost may not be realistic, even if we wish it were. I mean, so there's a, a pretty well-publicized case of a music blog, a hip-hop blog, uh, that was seized uh, for uh, over a year. Uh, and it turned out, eventually, it was able to basically persuade the Department of Homeland Security 
that the tracks that had been posted on the blog that were supposedly uh, his, his, you know, evidence of his criminal copyright infringement had actually been provided to, to the blogger by PR firms in the employ of the music labels themselves who were hoping that bloggers would circulate these to drum up interest in new artists. Uh, and so finally, a year later, he, you know, he's able to sort of establish this, and they sort of sheepishly uh, return his domain. Uh, but I think, you know, especially when you're talking about sites around the world, um, you, uh, you know, you, ha you have a very high risk of error, in particular because, uh, you know, I think the, the point James made here about the, the mixing of uh, legitimate and illegitimate content in, in one place. I mean, if you listen to what the backers of these bills say about what are the rogue sites, what are the, the, these worst of the worst sites that we need to take down that prove we need new legislation, they talk a lot about linking sites, that is, sites that do not necessarily themselves host infringing content, but link to it elsewhere on the internet, uh, and often the place it's linked to is file lockers, online cloud storage sites uh, that can be used to store basically anything. You can uh, keep a backup of your hard drive there, you can keep uh, an infringing movie file there, you can keep a big file you're trying to send to uh, you know, your cousin overseas of your, uh, of your wedding. Uh, there's the, the legitimate and the illegitimate content are mixed together. And when we talk about linking sites, you know, I mean, if you, you know, poke around a little bit, uh, where do people link to infringing content? Well, a lot of it is big discussion boards, right? So big discussion forums where there's a section where people are talking about music and then people are also saying, well, here's where you can get that new album. And, you know, bad, bad for them for doing that. Uh, but the question is, in, in terms of having a remedy that is tailored to the actual problem you're trying to solve, saying take that page down, take that post down, which is the DMCA approach, uh, is very different from saying block the site because there's enough different pages that uh, we, you know, basically the, the baby and the bathwater both need to get hurled out the window. Um, in addition, I think if you if you look at some of the arguments that the government makes. Uh, in interpreting its authority, uh, you should have a lot of concern, especially when you think about having the same authority uh, deployed by private parties who are able to find you know, a friendly judge in a friendly district somewhere. Um, in a case involving a Spanish site called Roja Directa, um, it basically was a site that compiled links, among other things, it compiled links to uh, places where you could, you could find streams of uh, sporting events. A lot of these were, of course, infringing. Uh, it was a site, though, that had been ruled legal under Spanish law, where it was operating, uh, repeatedly. It was still seized because it was registered in the US. Um, so without necessarily defending that site's business model, they did say, try to make this argument, look, we are legal under Spanish law. Um, and the response from the government was interesting. It said, look, uh, you seem to be under the misapprehension that we are suing you or charging you with criminal copyright infringement. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh This is an in rem action against the domain itself, right? We do not have to meet the burden of proving you guilty of criminal copyright infringement subject to the standard of proof that would apply if we were doing that. Uh, we need to make a prima facie showing to the court. The court agreed. And now the burden is on you, basically, to make the affirmative case uh, for, for why you should have your domain back. Now, you know, actually, earlier this week, I was on a panel with uh, Dimitri Shapiro, CEO of a company called Vio. Uh, it was sued. Uh, it was a video streaming site. It was innovative. Sued by some of the major studios for copyright infringement. Won after great expense. Um, then, of course, the uh, movie studios appealed, and then they won the appeal. But by the time they won the appeal, they were bankrupt. So, uh, you know, they were offline anyway. So, you know, ask yourself what happens if companies that do have a history of, you know, being very aggressive about making these claims, um, you know, to, you know, in part attack their competitors, um, is able to say not only, you know, do you have to fight this suit, but... What we get to do up front, if we can convince a judge who hasn't heard your side yet that we have a claim with merit, is ensure that during the course of this, until you've won your case, uh, not only do you have to pay your lawyers, but by the way, you can't make ad revenue. And by the way, no payments from your users are going to go through. So yeah, you have no funds. Um, so now go and try and find an investor to back you through this litigation. Um, that's that's going to be a, a difficult uh, proposition. And this is, I think, especially concerning, again, when you're talking about something where de facto the effect here is to shut down websites, which are inherently a form of speech, not all of which is legitimate, but it is inherently sort of a speech-based enterprise. And so then to say, uh, you know, 
we're going to make it this easy uh, to, in effect, block sites that don't meet with the approval of private actors, private copyright holders, or the attorney general, um, you know, creates enormous problems.